So I'm Mike. Um, we're going to talk about securing the digital beachhead. I hope everyone can hear me. It's a small room, so I don't need to uh, have the mic. Um, this is just a little about me. We've kind of covered that. I'm an Air Force guy. I was in the Air Force for 20 plus years. Um, I started cybersecurity before there was cybersecurity went into the Air Force because I hacked into our base's network. Um, and at that time, we really didn't have a base network. We had base computers. And instead of getting in trouble, the commander said, how did you do it? It was a batch program. I told him I hit two keys and I owned the computer. And he said, well, you're not in trouble anymore. Now you're in charge of all our small computers. You're the guy. We'll send you to training. So <laughs> that's how I started in computer security way back in the day. So today I'm going to go over like what is a digital beachhead, what it is we're defending, um, locations of the protected equipment and data. We're going to talk a little bit about the cloud. I'm going to cover a bit more about the Internet of Things. Um, that's a new topic that people are um, starting to learn about in mass. Those of us in the computer world, we've kind of been thinking and worrying about the Internet of Things. So now I'm going to scare you as well. Um, I'm going to talk about what is, an attack vector is, what the top cyber attack vectors are, and um, more importantly, what are your concerns? You know, we're all here for small business. What are the small business concerns? And then what you should do, and then we'll have time for questions. And feel free, we're a small room. Feel free to ask questions as we go. So what is a digital beachhead? Well, in traditional terms, a beachhead was popularized during World War II. It was the beach, the landing zone. It was what we protected or defended, um, where the enemy or ourselves was trying to gain a foothold. So conventionally, in digital terms, we think of that as our firewall, you know, our outside. They're trying to come in. But does that really work in today's digital age? And that's what we'll go into. So the digital, the term digital beachhead, was first used by myself on a performance report. Anyone been in the military? So we have our annual performance reports. Of course, we have to hype ourselves up. I wrote that I secured the digital beachhead for the space networks in the Air Force. And the commander said, what the is a digital beachhead? And who do you think you are saying you secured it? So I kind of pulled something out of my behind and said, well, just like the beachheads of old, my job is internet security or you know, the network security. So if I'm supposed to be protecting it, I'm protecting that beachhead. I'm not letting the intruders in. He, that's pretty smart. So then he put it on an awards package for the wing, and it worked its way up to the, Secretary, uh, the Deputy Secretary of Defense. And in 2008, there was a USB hack on a classified system that was deployed. Someone put in a USB device, and it brought down the network. Um, and the Secretary, William Lin, said, that code spread undetected on both classified and unclassified systems, establishing what amounted to a digital beachhead. My term had made it. It went from my performance report, trying to make me look shiny, to the Secretary of Defense. So I bought the name. <laughs> Created an LLC, thought I'd retire one day. It'd be good to own the name forever. <laughs> so what I consider a digital beachhead is that point where defenders or attackers try to secure your equipment, your data, it's an entry point. The thing we want to know is, where is that in digital terms? It isn't that firewall anymore. It's kind of everywhere. So if there's IT, that's your, that's your beachhead. So what is it we're protecting? As we've heard in briefings all day, we're protecting our data. We have our personal data. We have our business data. We have customer data. Personal data, we think, well, no one cares, but it's our information, our own information. How many business people here have, they're the only employee of their company? You know, if you're the only employee, you think, no one wants my stuff, but everybody wants all of our stuff at all times. Your business data, I don't take credit cards. I don't do anything that anyone's gonna want. We all have information because we all have customers. Customer data, just who they are. If you collect any information, information is power. That's what these people want. Our operations, denial of service, 
we're going to go into attack vectors later, but basically if they can shut you down, they've stopped you from operating. That's something you don't want to have happen. You're going to lose money. If you can't operate, you're going to lose money. Ransomware. We've been hearing that in the other briefings. When they send ransomware to your computer, it effectively either locks your computer up, threatens to delete files, and it's just like ransom of old. It says, give me X amount of dollars, and I'll free your system. The FBI says don't pay it, because of course if they get you once, and you don't fix it, do you think they'll come back? Of course they'll come back. And next time they'll charge you more, because you paid the first time. <coughs> I always told my kids they were done. You get kidnapped when we're overseas, sorry. Dad's not paying, you know? <laughs> if you're lucky, I can be like the guy from Taken, I can find you, but I was an IT guy, I didn't really have those skills. And then other disruptions, anything that stops your business from operating is something that hackers and intruders are gonna try to do. So where is that data located? Where is that stuff located? I start off with ourselves. We maintain the most valuable data. We know our passwords, we know where our equipment is, we know what our company knows. So when people talk phishing emails where you go off to someone else, sometimes they just fish to get your information out of you. You know, how many employees do you have? I'm here for a survey. And they start gathering information on your business. Could be a competitor. Why are they asking you that information? Then of course, the typical places where all our information, our data is located, our computers, our laptops, our tablets, phones, servers, and then the infrastructure equipment, your routers, switches, hubs. Anything with an IP address. For those that don't know, an IP address is like your address, a street address. Your every device that's on the internet has an IP address. So that tells the world where it is. It's your home address. The cloud. Anyone know or really know what the cloud is? Kind of comes from, <laughs> go ahead. Someone else's computer. It kind of comes from the old diagrams of networks where they had a computer over here and a computer over here and I said they're talking. And in the middle they drew a nice picture of a cloud saying yeah and all that IT stuff happened in the middle. That's the cloud. Well now we store information there. Our email is there. We have services there. And then <laughs> there's the Internet of Things. Is everyone aware of what the Internet of Things is? It's effectively all the stuff that has an IP address that never used to have an IP address. Think of your thermostat that you can go, Alexa, turn up my house heat. How did that happen? It's over the internet. It's over the network in your house. Well, if it's on the internet, on the network, everyone can see it. It's vulnerable. So when we say the internet of things, it goes down to your refrigerator that knows you're out of milk. Well, you think, well, that's good. It helps me know I'm out of milk. But do you really think about securing your refrigerator when you plug it in? Like, oh, man, I've got an IT weakness right here in my, you know, refrigerator. We tend not to. You know, when you put on your Nest thermostat, you go, oh, I bet hackers are going to turn my house to heat up. Won't that be terrible? But it's really what they can do from that device, not what that device necessarily does. So the cloud, go into more detail. It's really a term of hosted services over the internet. Um, most people have like Google accounts, Yahoo accounts, those kind of things. That's technically in the cloud. Your email is in the cloud. We don't think of it that way often, but it is true. So we have file services. They were talking just earlier about Dropbox, Google has storage things. That's all in the cloud. So there's different types of clouds that they've defined. A private cloud is kind of that you've paid for it and it's yours. It's, it's segmented for you. There's the public cloud. That's like your Google Mail, those kind of things. Then a hybrid. A hybrid is kind of um, if you have a data center in your, in your company and then you also have some shared services that are out in the public domain and all that data is shared and, st and stored together. The issue with the cloud 
is that the data isn't necessarily like when you think of your computer, it's on, a, on your hard drive. When you put it into the cloud, Google, for say, doesn't have a single spot where your data is stored. It's spread out across all their data centers. Part of your data is here, part of your data is there. It could be backed up over here. So there's more than just a singular spot where your data may reside. So we have to start thinking about the cloud and the security that we have as small business owners with our data there. They mentioned earlier um, encryption, making sure your data is encrypted out in the cloud. That's very important. The Internet of Things, as we discussed, and my little diagram shows, it's everything. It's everything that has an IP address. We just don't think about it much. But now, video cameras started off with nanny cams, and people were like, oh, they were watching me through my nanny cam. But how many people have heard of Ring? Ring's in the cloud. People can see you coming and going. Ring now has home security. So now they can see if you have motion detection in your house. Nest. Nest does security cameras. They're doing your temp thermostat. Everybody have Alexa or Google Home. You know, I see security people going, no way in hell. Other people going, yeah, sure. <laughs> there is an example of Alexa sending an email to someone in a company about an argument between a husband and wife. Alexa misheard the conversation, thought they said this gentleman's name and send email, recorded the information, and sent him that file. So he's like, uh, boss, I think you're having problems at home. <laughs> so we have to be wary because it's listening. If you know, Alexa is listening all the time because how does she know to turn on? You know, we have the name, but the, that recorder, that listening is always going. So when we think of the Internet of Things, we really have to start thinking about what do we have connected? Anything in your home that says, hey, do you have a Wi-Fi? And then you connect it, that's a part of this Internet of Things. So we have to think about everything in our house that said, hey, yeah, I can connect to your phone. Oh, I need your Wi-Fi. You got an app for that? It's part of the Internet of Things. It's being run over the Internet. And if it's on the Internet, someone can get to it. That's why we've got to protect it. So attack vectors. We've heard vectors and we've heard some attack vectors. It's basically the way in. How are they going to attack your device, your data, your information? Um, in this example that I have here, it's basically showing, you know, this is your data, this is all the devices that may hold it. And then they have different attack vectors going in to try to get your data. As we said, and they've said outside, you get the email that says click here. That's their attack vector. Someone calls on the phone and says, hi, I'm with your IT department. That's their attack vector. So when you come into IT, it isn't just the typical what we see on movies where the guy's sitting at the computer hacking away into your system. Most attack vectors come to you. They somehow interact with you. And that's why they were saying that firewalls are no longer the super protection they were, because firewall stops that guy trying to get in, but if they send you an email, they're already on the inside. That email's sitting on your computer. So what you do with it matters. They're already inside the firewall. So that's why we have to think about attack vectors when we think about our IT security. How are they gonna get to me? <coughs> Excuse me. It could be physical, it could be electronic, and the most important is the human element. We have to worry about ourselves. So the top cyber attacks. These are the top cyber attack vectors. They're no, no particular order. Denial of service, or a distributed denial of service. That's effectively like they were talking about, you can hire one. But it's when they send in an ordinance amount of data to you to your computer, your network, so that your network can't handle it and effectively shuts down. They stop you from operation because your network is full of all this junk coming at you. That one's really easy to do. 
You can hire people to do it. There are things called botnets. Um, botnets are basically a collection of already hacked computers that work together in unison to do a certain purpose. So there's multiple reasons why you do not want your computer to be hacked, even if they don't want any data. If they take over your computer and it becomes part of a botnet, you're effectively committing a crime, even though you're unaware, with your computer against someone else. They've taken your computer over, added it to the botnet, and now we're using it as a denial service to someone else. <clears throat> Not only is it just bad juju to have your computer being used for bad things, but it's slowing your computer down, slowing your network down, because you are a part of this other network. A man in the middle attack, that's where someone intercepts and pretends they're in the middle of the data going back and forth. They're there intercepting it, seeing what's going on, pretending to be the person at the end. If you go to a website, they see where you're going, they pretend to be that website to answer back. So now you're communicating with that person instead of the server you thought you were. Spear phishing, phishing attacks. Um, these are more common. Most people know about them. That's where you get the email and it says, hi, it looks like your credit card company. Click here, we gotta change your password. Click there. And it goes to not Citibank, but CB Bank or some other one letter alteration. Citibank, something different. You're in a hurry, you don't pay qu close attention to the URL. You put in all your information. They tend to forward you back to the real Citibank and you're like, oh, that didn't work, and you log in again, but they've already got your login and password, so now they can log in as you. That is by far the number one way that people are getting into your networks. This is your users. This is yourself. So we have to educate. A drive-by attack, that's where they've broken into a website that's popular, loaded some software on that website, so that when you happen to hit that website, it downloads the software to you. So with small businesses, you have a website, you don't think about securing it, and someone loads malicious software on your website, and then you start sending your customers there, and all of a sudden all your customers' computers start breaking down. All your customers' computers have ransomware. The only commonality is they went to your website. Someone had broken into it and put stuff on it. So that's something that you have to worry about. Standard password attack. Of course, we use password one, two, three. Password, no password, all zeros. We, of course, we think everyone knows to change them, but we know they don't. But that's a great attack vector. Um, also, uh, when I was in the military, we used to look around the room. Most passwords are something I can see. So I would just look around the room where I was in someone's office and there was a picture of a dog. Hey, what's your dog saying? Got it. Try that as a password. Got a picture of your kids? Great. And then they thought they were being clever and they had just a random picture up but it had words on it. I'm like, oh, try some of these words. Because people use stuff they can see to help them remember. Of course, that was after I lifted their keyboard to see if they had it under their keyboard because that's where most of them were. <laughs> a SQL attack. SQL, SQL, that's for databases. So if you maintain a database for your company and you have some sort of uh, entry of information from your website into that database, a SQL attack is where they use SQL code, the database code, to put in to your forms on your website to try to trigger the SQL to do, the database to do information kind of directly, kind of command line, direct command line into the database. So you're saying, hey, just give me your first name, last name, and they put a bunch of computer code instead, and if you don't have your computer set up and your, your server set up and your SQL set up correctly, that SQL server may go, oh, you want me admin? Sure, let me give you the admin access to the database, because you haven't protected from the code. Eavesdropping. It is what it is, you can, you're listening in. That's either, as they said, when on the phone, and they're like, what's that? What's your social security number? Or on the line, 
where I'm just wa watching the wire. Nothing's encrypted. I'm just listening to what you're doing. Malware. Everyone kind of has understood the idea of viruses. It's kind of morphed more into malware, which is any negative software, anything that can harm your computer, viruses, um, Trojan horses, those kind of things. The insider threat. This is always, always, always something that people ignore because we don't think about it. These people work for us. They're not going to hurt us. But do you have a competitor? They pay better. Do you have to let them go because you're downsizing? That's, that's someone who's got a reason to be upset. And then there's a, sometimes the guy who is just nonplussed, don't really care about security. I come in, I give you my eight hours. What are you worried about? So I'm going to go out to the site anyway, even though you told me not to. That's a threat. It's a threat vector. <coughs> and theft of equipment. We tend not to think of that because we try to think our places are secure and what are they going to do with my hard drive anyway. But if we travel and you have a laptop, they're easily taken. Um, if someone's desperate, they can break in and have your information direct because it's on your hard drive. Um, if it's not encrypted, they have it. I say this is kind of not the direct source because you can get it over the internet. I don't have to risk your security cameras and breaking in, having a B&E and the police come, if I can grab it over the internet. But sometimes a quick snack and grab is the easiest way to get your stuff, more so with your tablets, your phones, your laptops. But if you happen to be working in an industrial park somewhere and your computer system's in the back of your garage, could be easy to grab that stuff. So something to think about. So what does it mean to us as small business owners? Well, 58% of all malware attack victims are small businesses. 58% are us, small business owners. Why do we think that is? Any ideas? Easy. All anchors, they don't want you really, they want you to do everything anchors. Right. And easy in the sense of, I break it down if we think of Ocean's Eleven. It's a major heist. It takes lots of planning. So Google, there's 100 million pieces of information I need. It's a little more difficult to get into. They've got people dedicated to stop me. It's going to be a bigger heist. Or do I hit 1,000 small businesses who have no protection and still gather that much information. Low hanging fruit, go for what's easy. Go for what's available. You can get in quick and easy. And almost more importantly, if we don't have any security set up, do you know if they broke in? If it's not ransomware, if they're not holding you ransom, how do you know right now that no one's taken your data off your computer? Can you tell me they haven't? You don't know. So they can come in and come in again and come in again. And as your business grows, so is their database of all your information. So we're easy targets if we don't think about protection. And cyber breaches, they had the big number. They mentioned that earlier. But individually, they cost anywhere from 84000 to 148000 per breach. The chart on the right kind of breaks it down. This. The chart on the right shows, um, it's from Verizon. It's showing a, a, a collective amount of data and the dollar amounts are for the big picture of all the people they interviewed. But per is 84 and 148, but it's cost 25% system downtime. You gotta shut your system off. what they say was the first thing you do? Power it off, right? Get out of it, unplug it from the internet. You're not working. The IT and end user productivity loss, well, if it's my computer that's down, what am I not doing? How many of us need our computers to do our job or some portion of our job? So if your computer's offline, what do we do? We tend to be twiddling our thumbs hoping that that computer comes up pretty quick because I've got emails I've got to answer. 23 is um, theft of information assets. That's your theft, the actual stealing of your stuff. And then there's smaller percentages 
damage, lawsuits, your reputation damage. Um, those are calculated by experts that tell you, I, I don't know how to put a number to my reputation damage, but there are people out there that can assign a dollar amount to that. But the big number is 60% of all of those businesses that get hacked, small businesses that get hacked, go out of business within six months. Can you take an $84,000 hit right now? You know, your computer's down. Think about law enforcement. They say call out law enforcement. Do you think the FBI is gonna be down there in the next 30 minutes to come fix your computer, grab all the data so you can hurry up and get back to work? I guarantee they're gonna take your computer, bring it to a forensic lab, they're gonna do their forensics on it, which basically means they copy your hard drive to another non-touched you know, device so that they can play with that, find out what's going on, submit a report, then maybe you'll get your computer back. So to start, you have money right now just to build a new IT system. Grab a new laptop, grab a new iPad, whatever you're using for your computer. That's where you have to start. <coughs> so that's the scary part to me is that 60% go out of business. 92.4% of all malware is delivered via email. Phishing attempts, just sending you stuff to take over your computer, ransomware. When I was in the military, we used to run tests. And in the military, we pound you over the head about IT security. You know, there's briefings, there's annual briefings, commander calls, you know, we're told all the time. So I would send out emails that said, You've just won the lottery. All you have to do is give me your email, your name, other data, and people would be like, oh, filling it out. Highly educated, people who are trained all the time, and we'd get at least 25 to 30% response rate every time because you offered them something cool. So while we always say education is the key, education is important, realize people are people. <laughs> we still want stuff. And the ransomware is a growing concern. I reckon this to like the mafia of old. You come in to the business and they say, look, no one will touch you. You just pay me so much a week. I got the protection racket. Well, now you have those guys on the internet going, hey, I shut your computer off. You want to turn it back on? All you got to do is pay me. And that's why they say, again, don't pay them because sure, they can unplug it. You know, whatever they've put in, they'll remove. You have access to all your data. You're like, whew. When, I don't know the exact, that was something I would like to find out, but the exact timeline of when do they hit you again? Because you think they won't. They'll think, yeah, we got this sucker. They paid us that 500 bucks. We're good. Mafia didn't do that. Criminals don't think that way. They think we got someone who's willing to pay us. There you go, they'll be back again and again and again. This is another scary number, but that's why we're all here. 21% of small and medium-sized businesses rate their ability to mitigate cyber risks as highly effective. So here, who thinks that their ability to mitigate risk is highly effective? Okay, about 21%. That means we're all vulnerable. That means this is exactly what they're looking for. This is why they're gonna come hit us as targets. We're all taking the great first step, we're getting educated, but we're vulnerable. So another small business concern is many small businesses, myself included, we use a lot of cloud devices. How many in here have their own email server? One. The rest, you use some sort of third-party email. It's in the cloud. Your email's out there for someone else to get to. You don't directly protect it. How many people use file storage in the cloud? Or do you just use your, you know? Most of us put our files out in the cloud, or if, if we're not big enough, we might hold it all on our computer. But that would be your private cloud, your own computer. So you have to take steps to protect it. Small businesses, how many 
small businesses here have some dedicated IT support. Not third party, just you have an IT guy. Okay? That's much smaller. You know? Another reason why we're vulnerable. If I'm making cupcakes for a living, I really probably don't know the ins and outs of IT. Why would I? It's not my career choice. But I'm a business. I'm going to have customers' information. I'm going to have all the data the hackers want. Yet, I probably either, one, can afford, or two, don't understand the risk to hire someone to be my IT person. We have less time, money, resources. Doing my own business, I know I work harder now than I ever did when I worked for someone else. Basically, I can't tell myself I'm sick. I know I'm lying. So, you know, HR, me again, gets really upset. <laughs> and I have to write myself up. It's a big mess, you know, <laughs> when I just call in sick and say, nope, <coughs> not feeling it today. So, we just don't have that time. We're too busy chasing work. We have to pay ourselves. We have to eat, you know? The last thing we're thinking of is, oh, geez, all this information I got from my customers, who cares who has that, you know? Again, going back to making cupcakes, do I care? I'm selling cupcakes, you know? But if I'm getting some credit card information or I'm getting direct billed for some reason, people, that data could be important to someone. Often we have a haphazard approach with no clear strategy how we're going to deal with IT. And I, I, I want to mention that a clear approach of I have no approach really isn't a good approach. It's still haphazard. But I've had someone tell me that. They're like, well, my, I'm not haphazard in my approach. I have none. It's pretty clear, pretty concise. <laughs> it's true, but not really getting you anywhere. So hackers use all of this information against you. This is what they need. This is what they want to know. This is why we're the target. That's why they come for us. So how do you secure your digital beachhead? You're starting it right now. You've been here all day. You educate yourself and your team. For those who have a team, you're going to go back and you have to talk to them about what you've learned, stuff you know. You need to know what devices are connected to the internet. You have to think about your Internet of Things. Think about the cloud. Think about the data you have. What would people want? And you have to really think about it, because don't just think credit card. Don't think of the big value. But would a competitor be interested to know who your customers were? Just a list of your customers. Probably. <coughs> when you think of your cloud usage, they mentioned it, your SLAs. Um, anything you can encrypt, any, any steps you can take to help protect that data or understand that relationship. I'm guilty of it. I know a lot of us are. The user agreement that you get, it says click here. You're like, yeah, I'm going to click here. Do we read the 14 pages of telling us exactly what they're going to do with our data? No, we're in a hurry. I click here because then I can get to do what I want to do. But we need to know that if our business data is going to be used by that third party or stored by that third party. Encrypt your data or use this uh, security software, appropriate devices, have a firewall. People think of a firewall as your edge device to a network, but many computers have built-in firewalls or firewall software you can put on your PC. So get that kind of software. A lot of it's free on the internet. Um, low cost as well. Make sure you have your antivirus, your anti-malware um, programs. Secure as much as you can secure. Take your due diligence to secure what you can. Encrypt data. There are uh, software kits and Windows. If you get the Windows Pro, they mentioned that earlier. That will encrypt the data on your hard drive. Takes a little longer to boot up, but your data is secure if someone snatches the computer. Something to think about. Securing your Wi-Fi. The one thing that I haven't heard yet was to hide your network ID. Most people have Wi-Fi, and you, you turn on your phone, and you can see everybody's Wi-Fi in your neighborhood. You can hide that. It's an option so that you have to know what it is, and you have to type it in manually to connect. So on your business network, you could do that. So if people are roaming around, they don't even know you have a Wi-Fi. For the Wi-Fi I share, I call it NSA collection, just to scare the neighbors. 
you know, when they see that the NSA collection Wi-Fi is in their neighborhood. Little things. Use the virtual private networks. They've talked about that before. There are free ones. There are some low-cost ones. That effectively is a tunnel from where you are, and it brings you out to where you're going, and it encrypts all the data that's tra traversing while you're on the network. Keep your data backups current. As an IT guy, I know that's one of my hardest things to do. We preach, but we don't always do. Keeping your data current is very, very important. So always have backups, current backups. The two-step authentication or password security software. Um, when I got my laptop, it allowed me to log in with a picture and a password. So I now get that option. It's usually something you have and something you know. Password, something you know, something you have. Fingerprint, facial recognition, something like that. <clears throat> the big one, default username and passwords. The story the gentleman just talked about. Everything comes with a default username and password. Your routers, your switches, and most people don't change them. And they're all available on the internet. You can Google, what's the default password for a Cisco router? It'll tell you. Because the defaults are known. They're usually stuck, stickered on the box. You can go to Best Buy and go, oh, they have this kind of router. Oh, there's the default username and password. So if we don't change them, if we don't take those simple steps to change them, then that's just an opportunity, another attack vector. Keeping your software up to date, the patch management. This is something I like to talk about because when we talk about being secure, we all know that patches come out. Every security person will tell you, hey, keep your patches up to date. But you patch your computer on this date, and then you get another patch on this date. Why do you think this patch came out? It's because they found another vulnerability. So between the time you patched here, and they told you to patch and you patched here, at some point in the middle of that, there's a slide point where someone figured a hole. Well, you're vulnerable. So if anyone tells you just securing them, oh, my patches are up to date, I'm secure. You're never secure. You're just accepting that risk, and you're as secure as you can be with the latest patch. But if there's no more hacks, we would have no more patches. They'd figure it all out. Systems would be closed. I'd be out of a job. You know? <laughs> my wife would cry. It'd be terrible. So you have to remember that. There's always, always going to be a vulnerability. Otherwise, there's no reason for a new patch. And this one is very important. Implement formal security policies and abide by them. If you don't have it written down, your employees aren't doing it. You know, if you don't tell them to have a big password or a long password or a passphrase, and their password is password, you're not telling them what to do. It's not a policy. They're not breaking anything. So you have to have the policies in place. And then get help, like you are here. We're here. We're learning. You're getting help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. As far as education, because I think this is very important, you have to share the importance with everyone with regular training. In a small business, it seems really odd to say, hey, three of us get together and let's talk about network security. But you have to, because if you're not talking about it, they're not caring about it. We have to educate. Keeping an open door and talking about breaking down the fear and shame of reporting, you have to let them know that all computer systems are vulnerable. We're not impenetrable. If Again, on that slide rule, at some point, there's going to be a place where we can get hacked. So if we're doing all we can to be secure, but you still are hacked, you're still broken into, you still clicked on that phishing email because we're human, you have to be able to tell us. But if you don't tell us, it's only going to get worse. Because once they get your system, they can get your system, they can get your system, it'll grow. So you kind of have to have that open door, that reporting culture, and say it's okay. You know, We're going to do everything we can to stop it, but if it happens, we need to know right away. You got to protect your workspace physically, electronically. Um, how many people get up? I've been to doctor's offices where the medical tech will come in, log in for the doctor, and be like, okay, the doctor will see you in a minute. And they leave. And there I am with the terminal to the hospital's network. 
logged in under a doctor's credentials, which I assume are, you know, can see around a bit. I don't, I have yet to, you know, slide over and start going, hey, you know, my kids tell me the truth about their, you know, not yet, maybe one day, but not yet. So you have to protect your workspace. We think, oh, the phone rang, or I'm going to get a cup of coffee, or I'm going to, depending on where you are, it's a vulnerable terminal. Don't install unapproved software. We think about this in terms of, well, I'm not going to put software on my computer that I don't need. But we're in the world of apps and games. And Facebook has this little connector that we can use that'll connect me to this or that, or like they were saying, show me what I look like when I'm 50 years older. If, if you're on a company computer, definitely don't. And for small business owners, that you don't really have a company personal, you have your laptop, you're doing it yourself, you have to start thinking about the business side when you have your personal side, you know? My suggestion would be to create a separate login, one for business, one for personal, two profiles. <clears throat> Five simple steps. Of course, assume all attachments are bad. Someone sends you something, why? Who are you? What is the attachment? You know? Do you have the scanning software on your email to scan the attachment before you open it? You know? Because that's the number one way you click on that picture. Inside of pictures is malware. Loads onto your computer. PDF, Word documents. Another thing to think of when you're thinking of attachments and emails is how many people have their email list here and then the preview window over here. And if you have your preview window open, that opens that email. Sometimes it only can open headers or the first two lines, but you can have it set up to like, it basically opens your email. If there's malware in that email, well, when you click on it over here and it pops up over here, you've just opened it whether you want to or not within email. So if you use an HTML as a view, you know, when you want to be able to see all the pictures and the backgrounds and stuff on your email, that's more dangerous than if you say text only. If you set your emails to text only, you'll get a lot of character squiggles and code and stuff because it's not letting it through, but it's also not opening anything in the background on your preview page. In line with that, stay alert for phishing emails. Your bank is not going to email you saying, hey, damn, we lost your password. Send it to us. You know, it's not going to happen. They're getting more and more sophisticated, though. Um, it used to be you could tell the phishing emails because the English wasn't well written or the characters were out of place. Has anyone used Google Voice? You can get any phone number you want anywhere in the country from Google. Just get an account. And it's called Google Voice. And you say, I want to live in, or you know, I want my phone number to show from. That's your phone number. So people where you used to live, you know, so it's not like it's getting very complicated to spoof these things anymore. It's, it's getting really, really easy. Um, update systems and software patches, as we've talked about. Public Wi-Fi, everyone's paranoid about public Wi-Fi. Using a VPN will help you, you know. Um, it's not that we, you have to avoid it every time, but if you set yourself up and you know the risks, you're definitely not gonna be doing, as I said, or outside the financial documents over, you know, don't check your bank statement while you're at Starbucks, you know. And then complex, lengthy passwords, passphrases. This one I always, I always hated the, pass, the random password generator when it's just a bunch of gobbledygook because you're not gonna remember it until we're gonna write it down or we're gonna put it somewhere. So I'm not a proponent of coming up with the most obscure password that you're never going to remember, unless you're willing to hit forgot my password every time and change it to some other obscure thing until the next time you log in. <laughs> um, I would say pass phrases or using sentences and then taking the first letter of the sentence and then creating that into obscure, A being an at sign, uh, S being a five or a dollar sign, something along that line, but it's something that you can remember. But a good password cracker will have like a sequencer. Like, it used to be just a dictionary. You know, when we were breaking passwords, we would have Webster's, and we'd go through all of Webster's. 
Then hackers got smart because some hackers are real geeks, so they understood Klingon. So we loaded the Klingon dictionary because they thought they were being clever speaking Klingon in their passwords. So you load the Klingon. And then there's the people who are doing, like I do this row and then this row. So then that's all loaded on. Now if it's random, truly random, that's harder. But if it's just a pattern, those have been included into hacker dictionaries to try to crack. So again, it's, you have to make it easy to remember. I, I am very forgetful, so I need to have something I can remember. But it needs to be difficult enough that it's not just something that's gonna generate. So if there's a sentence you say or a saying you like, again, you can take the letters or maybe the second letter or you, know, you mix it up that way, add in special characters as part of that saying, then a number at the end or something. So the idea is to make it difficult for them, but easier for you. So that's why I say a passphrase, but don't use the passphrase as your password. Create a phrase that you know, and then take some sequence of those letters so that you can easily go back to it, but it's still difficult. It's not going to be something someone will generate. Securing cloud and IoT devices. Number one is know what you're connected to. You have to know what you're connected to. So when you're going through and figuring out what data is important to you, and really to in that dig deep like I talked about earlier, think about where is it? Is it on my laptop? This is laptop backup. Does, do I have an automatic backup? Some software companies provide an automatic backup, Norton, to some other Norton spot. Does that mean Norton has it? You know, really think about where is my data, <laughs> you know? Um, contact your cloud provider if you have a contract with them. You know, like most Dropbox, we don't really have a contract. We have that agreement that we clicked OK on right away. <laughs> so kind of go back and actually read it and see what it says. You know, if they'll answer you, you say, hey, how are you securing my data? <laughs> you know, but think about that stuff. Read those, those um, agreements. And then where you can encrypt it, do two-factor um, authentications. Take all the security steps you can. We think it's a pain. It might take a little longer to load, but take these steps. It'll secure you. Because going back to the danger slide of losing your business 60% and the cost, it's like being hit by a bus. I haven't been hit by a bus yet, but I tend not just to walk into the street without looking because, you know, I got to protect myself. I take the minimum security step and go, okay, I think I can go. But I don't use the excuse, well, I haven't been hit by a bus yet. It must be good. No bus is going to hit me. No, you're not going to worry about your IT hack until you've been hacked, and then now it's too late. IoT devices should have defaults changed. We discussed that. And <laughs> users who connect to devices. It would be best, even on your Wi-Fi, if you had different logins for different people. If you can create a login to your Wi-Fi, not just knowing where it is, but an actual password and setting up different passwords for people because then you know who's doing what. So if you look at the new Comcast box, you can create users on your, on your home networks by device, so you know that device is connected to your Wi-Fi. When that device connects to the Wi-Fi, you can give it a name. So if it's your kid's iPhone, you put their name, iPhone, and then you can look at your Comcast connection and it'll show you how long they're on the net, when they're on the net, and if someone's on the net at four in the morning from your work computer, and no one's at work at four in the morning, it's a good signal that maybe something funky's going on, and you might need to check that box. You know? But if it's just a single password, well, at four in the morning, you would know, hey, something happened, it shouldn't have happened. But who? What computer? What device? So the more you can segment things out, the better. And then when you're going to buy IoT things or you're going to connect to the cloud, creating cybersecurity policies. For a business, if you don't have a policy, no one's, nothing for them to follow. So you have to set rules for IT use and really emphasize they're important. It comes from us, comes from the top. We have to tell people we mean this. I didn't write this policy for no reason. It's there for a reason. For your backups, as I say, I'm always the, the as an IT guy, we're the last to sometimes do what we preach. 
If you set a timeline for your backups, like every Wednesday I'm backing up everything, or I have so much data I have to back up every day, you know, set that time and put it in a policy. The creation policy with sizes, set it so that they know. Are they creating a 187 character password because they think they're being real secure and then taping it under their keyboard because they can't remember it? Set the policy and say, hey, we're going to go 10 to 15, no recognizable words, special characters will be used. Now they kind of have an idea of where to get their passwords from. The patching, as soon as possible, but you should have that. Especially in the bring your own device, you know, so people know they need to update their software. Give them a timeline. 48 hours after it's out. 24 hours after it's out. But some timeline. The guidelines for people bringing their own devices. If you're going to allow someone to bring their own iPad to work on your network, do you want them to have every game and app and everything under the sun while they're on your network? on their computer, because if they can break into their device, now they can get into your device. So you have to think about that. And this is where it gets tough when you're talking personal and privacy and, and those kind of things. But if they're going to use it and you're going to allow them to use it, if you can set up another profile, when you come into work, you have to log out of your personal profile, log into a, a work profile. But something to think about and something to put into a policy. So you can hold them accountable if they're playing words with friends while on company time. Which I'm guilty of. But it's my company, so again, I go back to HR, yell at myself. It's a nightmare. Online training materials and where to find them. Being small businesses without an IT department, we don't really have the resources to create the, hey, let me tell you all about IT security. I make muffins. I don't understand it myself. But there are places out there, go find them. We've given them tons of resources today, you know. But make sure your employees get this knowledge you're getting. It's very important. Sensitive data and how to protect it. If your employees don't know what's sensitive to you, how they know to protect it. Again, we all think, oh, credit cards. I'm never going to give so much credit card information away. But I forgot that I was talking to everyone about how we serviced this customer the other day, and it was great, and we made so much money on it. I think that's sensitive. I don't want my employees bragging about, I mean, I love that they brag about us, but not that specific. Lock computers and devices when not actively in use. Securing portable media. Are these in your desk drawer, just sitting there? What was on it last? Did you delete it? Did you totally wipe it? You know, we have to protect it. Report lost and stolen devices immediately. That's that culture of telling. <laughs> yes, I'm going to be upset you lost my laptop. But I'm going to be more upset if you don't tell me you lost that laptop. And I find out later or the customer list is all gone and the competitors got it. Or, you know, someone's charging all our customers' credit cards, something. And then privacy settings. Use them. Apply them. Facebook, other things. And then the key is everyone has an active role in cybersecurity. That's the thing we have to really tell folks because people don't think that I'm not IT, nothing to do with me. We either hire someone, I don't know where it comes from in some companies, they're like, I don't know, boss gave me this and someone handles it. So we have to let everyone know that the data is important and everyone wants it, so we gotta protect it. So is your digital beachhead secure? We've kind of gone through all kinds of where they're coming from, some small steps of what we can do. And the first step to understanding, it, the first step is understanding and accepting there's a risk. As I talked about with the patch, are you secure? Are you ever secure? I don't think so. There's always a window where we can get into. What you're trying to do is your best due diligence to be as secure as possible. If we do nothing, you're definitely not secure. But you do all you can and try to be as secure as possible. Because just like um, they tell you in just crime at your house, if you left your door open and you can see your big screen TV through the door in the back, and there's no cars in the, dr in the driveway and the garage door is open, there's no cars, I think that might be an open invitation to maybe try and go get some stuff. But I've had the door shut and I have a security camera out front 
and I'm walking down that street, I'm like, I might give that house a pass. Doesn't mean I can't get in, I can't get their stuff, but it's a little more difficult. So you just try to add those layers of difficulty. Plan cybersecurity into your business planning and budget. Again, it's important, so think about it. Doesn't mean it takes a lot of money. Not all of us have lots of money in our companies, but you have to plan it in, in some form or fashion. If you think, ah, when I get bigger, I'll get it. You're already putting it off. You're never gonna be big enough, you know? So just plan it in, think about it. Like when we're going back to the Internet of Things, do I really need this Nest thermostat? Stay current, stay informed, and more important, always ask for help. IT firms like myself, we're out there. There's plenty in town. Um, the SBDC offers it, you know, go get help. You have to protect yourself is the bottom line. It's taking the steps to show that you thought of security. So when we go to the insurance, like they mentioned, oh, I'll get cyber insurance. Well, the, just like any insurance, right? They're going to try to find a reason not to pay. <laughs> well, cyber insurance will be the same way. What did you do to protect yourself? Well, nothing. You know, I bought you. <laughs> They'll be like, well, no. You have to take some minimal steps to protect yourselves. So with small businesses, I know it's difficult. You know, we, we think that IT is like the big scary beast. But the idea is to break it down into small, doable pieces. And just start hitting, chipping away. You know, because if you think, well, I'm unsecure and I got to get to secure. No, you're never going to get to secure. So just start taking security steps. And that's what I got. Thank you. Thank you. Now we can get drinks. <laughs> <laughs>